So as you know, the subject to be discussed is wives, daughters, and courtesans of the Raj. In a way, it is the story behind the curtain, um, the tales that go on behind the white zanana, if you like. And we have three authors who, who between them, cover a great expanse of history. So let me introduce you, if you, if you will, just to them in chronological order, as they have dealt uh, with these very interesting periods of history and these very uh, interesting intersections that took place between Great Britain and <laughs> India, as it then was. Katie Hickman is uh, currently working on a very exciting project, soon to come to a bookshelf near you, called Daughters of the Raj. Uh, we have Margaret Macmillan with us, who deals with the period running up to the mutiny in uh, Women of the Raj, mothers, wives, and daughters. Uh, and last, but certainly by no means least, the blue-haired wonder on my left, Alex von Tunzelman, uh, deals with the 1900s through to independence in her fantastic work, and I urge you to read all of these books. They are wonderful. Indian summer. Um, so first of all, can I um, put this to you, that there is a, there is a preconception when we talk about the, the white women, the men Sabs who came from Britain, uh, that the men were actually quite reasonable. They got on quite well with the natives until these white women showed up and screwed everything up. Um, <laughs> So let, let's just start with that general premise, shall we, that all of the, the racism and intolerance that happened within the Raj was somehow heightened and sharpened when the Memsabs arrived. Um, sorry, my voice is gone. <coughs> I sound a bit like something from The Godfather. But I think it's actually very unfair that the women get blamed. What was happening is the type of men who were coming to India was changing, and the responsibility that the British felt towards India was different. I mean, they came out initially as freebooters. They came out to trade, make conquests. They were tough guys who couldn't stay in England most of the time. But by the 19th century, <coughs> excuse me, they were nice Victorian men who were strongly religious, strongly. So what you got was a different attitude towards India. When the East India Company became an administration, the sort of men who were coming out were different, and the company itself wanted them to marry respectable wives. Mm. And so the women came out, were expected to be part of the Raj. This was really after the mutiny in that period. And they were under tremendous pressure to be good wives and mothers and be great sort of attributes of the Raj. And so it was very difficult for them to do anything else. They were discouraged from getting too close to India. Um, in, in a way, we've sort of leapt to the, the middle period, whereas, Katie, I mean, the, the period that you deal with is um, a, a, an era which um, is, is beautifully also written uh, about by my friend um, uh, William Dalrymple, who's in the audience, that the white Mughal period, you know, when you've got people like Ochtaloni going through the streets with a, a parade of elephants behind him with his native wives and girlfriends following uh, in, in hot pursuit, if you like. And, and again, I sort of put it to you that that was a, a, a maybe a a more understanding era, perhaps, where yes. there was more of a mixing of cultures. I think there was. I think that's true. Um, I just want to add one point to what uh, Margaret was saying, which is that, that um, back in England, it was also back in England that people's perceptions had changed. And in the 1790s, you got the rise of the evangelical movement, and the people who went out to India, not only were they in a different m mindset, but they, they wanted to... Their, their newly revived religious feelings meant that instead of just going and pillaging the country, which is what they'd been doing before, they wanted to change things. They wanted to have an effect on Indians. They wanted, there were certain customs that they didn't like, and so they went in with a, more, a, a completely different moral agenda to the one that they'd had before. But, um, you're absolutely right. In the, in the, uh, my, my research has taken me right back to the really early days of the East India Company, and when there were very, very few women indeed. And in fact, the first ones that we, anyone knows about sailed out in 1617, which is incredibly early. And there were three women, um, Mrs. Towerson, um, Mrs. Hughes, and a woman called Frances Webb. And Frances Webb and Mrs. Hughes went as the, the companions to this lady, Mrs. Towerson, except unbeknownst to the, um, the captain of the ship that, that, that they went on, this woman, Frances Webb, had actually secretly married another man on one of the other ships, because they went in a flotilla of three. And as they went along, the journey took eight months, 
And as they went along, this woman's shape began gradually to change rather a lot in her stomach. And it was, became clear that she was pregnant by her, in fact, husband. She'd married this man. And there's a despairing letter from the captain of the ship going, I don't know what, what's happening with this woman. She must be about to have twins, either that, or she's going to give birth any minute on the ship. And in fact, she was able, she did make it to the shore. It would have been quite something to have had a baby on this boat. She made it to Surat, where one of the, well, the first factory, English factory was. And um, her baby would have been the first English child born, born in India. That, well, the, what, what a tremendously amazing story. But also, it, I mean, it tells you so much. It tells you a little bit about the passions and pluck of the women who came over, that they were passionate creatures who were not frightened of what was a really arduous journey that you can conceive, get pregnant, and almost they deliver were, a baby just so on the brave. way over. Well, Margaret and I were talking about this yesterday, about the incredible bravery of these women. And in fact, the first sort of contingency of women who were actively sought out by the East India Company was in, well, the earliest one I've been able to find was in 1688, when Charles II had, through his marriage to Catherine of Braganza, inherited Bombay, the island of Bombay, and a letter went back to England saying there are 115 men on this island, and we think it would be convenient, that was the word they used, convenient if you just send out some women, and we'd like 40, we'd like 40 <laughs> women to come out, <laughs> so, you know, to keep these men happy. Yeah. and. They found them uh, from Christ's Hospital, which is a, um, a school in London, founded very early on for poor children. They had boys and they had girls. And they asked on the, practically a shopping list. They said, we want 40 women between the ages of 12 and 30. So you just have to imagine what it might have been like for a 12-year-old child to make that journey to find a husband, who knows, yeah. who knows what it would have been like for them. I mean, I, I'm going to ask all of you uh, just to, to pick out some of your true heroines that, that you have come across in a moment, but just I, I think there was a really interesting shift in perception, certainly from the outside world, that you had this period when the voyages were hard, and then you've got this certain gritty type of frontiers woman, you know, sort of probably played by Ingrid Bergman in my head, you know, sort of who come out against all the odds, they, you know, so then they battle through terrain, they find a husband, they make a life. And then suddenly, in the 1900s, it became easier to make the crossing. And there is this suggestion that actually then, when it was easier, you got quite a bit of dross coming over, you know, the, the flirty fishing kind of period where women who couldn't get a husband in England would come to India uh, because the odds were much better. Well, of course, I mean, you also had a sense about the men that often empire was sort of what you did with your rather stupid third son who, who couldn't really find a job in England. And so, you know, off you sent him, or Scotland quite often, off you sent him to, uh, to make a name for himself in the empire and hopefully not come back. Um, so perhaps you did the same with your useless daughter on the same basis, <laughs> just ship her off. Um, but yes, in the kind of later period, um, obviously it became much easier to travel, which did somewhat change the kind of tenor of it. And there started to be, I think there probably had been earlier, which perhaps the others can talk about, a sort of moral panic a bit about these women. Um, and it's all around their sexuality, and it's funny that this is called sort of wives, daughters, and courtesans. I know some people will be very irritated mm. that we're defining these women entirely by their relationship to men in a sexual way. And there certainly are some who weren't defined by that. but it was a massive part of the relationship and there was a moral panic about these women um, you know actually kind of falling prey to Indian men um, and this would be very dangerous of course uh, and very disruptive to society and of course they often did <laughs> um, and then there was a great deal of panic about what to do about that uh, also around this time around kind of the 1900s there began to be um, a lot more popular press uh, and actually even sort of working class women in Britain would read women's magazines. And the number one most popular story of women's magazines, uh, which were read often by sort of, you know, by working class women who were perhaps shop workers or so on, the number one story was a uh, white woman is kidnapped by some sort of Nawab or Arab <laughs> sheikh um, and sort of debauched horribly. And uh, 
and it's very exciting, but of course it's morally unacceptable. So at the end of the story, she has to be rescued by a white man called Harold and taken back to the home counties, and then it's all fine. But of course the point of the story is this titillating idea about having an affair with, a, with an exotic oriental man and, uh, and really there was a lot of thought about that. Yeah, sometimes they're rescued but sometimes if, if they, they don't want to be rescued they die tragically. They die horribly. They die horribly, often they're in usually, childbirth yes, with a child that is never viable. They're know. quite often yeah. killed by the other women in the zanana. Right. There's, there's a sort of you know, plot, to, they get poisoned. Um, or, as in the Rudolph Valentino film, The Shake, which was sort of the biggest hit in the world in 1921, which has this plot as well. It turns out at the end of the film that, oh my goodness, The Shake is actually British. So it's fine. It's okay. He's a white guy all along. It's all right. Panic over. What a relief. Um, just going back to both of your sort of early, earlier periods. Um, so at the beginning, uh, it was just so very difficult, so very dangerous. I mean, we're, we're talking about pretty much a... A, a, an unknown terrain where maps have not even really been drawn up, where these men are going out and, and you know, almost with their Indiana Jones machetes, supposedly, <laughs> according to the popular press in Britain, they're carving Britain, Britannia, out of, out of the Indian soil. And at that time, the very first women to come out, who were they and why did they come out? They were a very, well, a disparate group. There were very few of them in the very early days. I mean, the really early ones went because they followed their husbands. Um, and the slightly later ones went because they wanted to, they wanted to find a husband. But um, I was interested by how early on, you know, um, Alexandra was saying how annoying it is to have women always defined by their relationships to men. Even um, my very early, these three women who went out in 1617, one of them, Mrs. Hughes, who's really the most interesting of them, tried to trade on her own account, and she tried to persuade one of the factors there to allow her to buy and sell a load of indigo, which was the main, um, you know, which was the main uh, crop that, pe that the British wanted. So their experiences were much more disparate and much more interesting than we are led to. But look at the newspapers of the time. If you look at the newspapers in the 18th century, you know, you find women uh, who were trading on their own account. You find women who opened shops. You find women who, there was one woman, was it Eliza Fay who opened a school? I think she opened a school for young women or a, mil or a milliner. They, they opened mil millinery shops, schools. There was a, quite a wide range. You know, they weren't necessarily, most of them did go with a husband. Sometimes the husbands, you know, left them and went off and they were forced to their, you know, to, to fall back on their own talents. And it must have been, very difficult for them, but there was a much wider range of opportunities that they that they took. And, and, and Margaret, I'm, I mean, I'm very keen to hear about the, the women who particularly captured your heart when writing. Um, but also, you touched on this before, and you, you, you said that you felt it was very unfair that women got the blame for so much that was wrong and mean and nasty about the Raj. It was certainly, you know, the moral panic that you talked about seemed to have blown up around the time of the mutiny that you know we have a different relationship with these natives we thought we could trust them but we can't now and now we have to we have to kind of ring fence ourselves you know circle the wagons a little bit and the mem subs were always at that time particularly blamed for the worst excesses of racism you know blocking out the natives having to be protected from the natives in literature and in in, in newsprint um, but you think that is unfair that 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 lies at their feet. Well, I think one of the things we must do as historians is always ask, what would, what would we have done in the same situation? You come out from England as a very young man, and you're told you've got to get married. You either are engaged or you come out as what's called the fishing fleet. And if you fail to be part of the whole enterprise, you're on your own. I mean, you, you, you have one choice. You only have one choice. And that is to become part of the community. If you don't, what do you do? Where will you go? And so I think for the women, I think maybe one is better. I think, thank you. I think for the women, they were in a very difficult position and they were seen, as, as Alex has said, as the sort of, but also the most vulnerable. They were to be protected, but it was also a suspicion that if they weren't protected, they might behave badly. Mm. And that India itself was seen as a menace. There are all these ridiculous books written by gynecologists 
in the 19th century that if British women stay in India too long, their internal organs will go funny and they will produce very strange little children that don't look like proper children. So I think, you know, that caught in this mind. I mean, there were some very strong-minded women who managed to ignore all this, but I think you had to be pretty strong-minded. Yeah, I mean, uh, but, but you do, I mean, yeah, some of those gynecological reports are, are hilarious, absolutely hilarious, but, but if you don't, do go to the, the graveyards of the Raj, they are littered with the tombstones of young women and children. Uh, the, these, were, these were difficult times for them. They, they often came from you know, the drizzly plates of England where the temperature rarely rises beyond 17 degrees, you know, and, and they are plunged into something so completely different and, and, and often hostile to what they know. You know, the, the elements are hostile to them. Yes, I think it must have been deeply weird and yes, very challenging on the basis of your health and so on, you know, different immunities, different everything. Um, and also, of course, having to still wear all your British clothes. It must have been incredibly hot <laughs> for a lot of them, I imagine, um, which is probably one, part of the reason there was so much fainting and illness. And then, of course, people start assuming that fainting and illness is what women do, you know, which perhaps you wouldn't if you weren't laced into brocade all the way up to your neck. Um, I mean, but no, when they started, I, I think what also becomes sort of interesting later on is that when women come out here, it allows them to reinvent themselves in certain ways. So the movements around empire allow a great degree of reinvention for women, often in terms of their class. Um, so you get women like, I mean, I've got a wonderful picture of my great-grandmother, who was a very working-class British woman, um, who came out to Burma, which was then part of the Indian Empire, with my great-grandfather, who was an army cook. Um, and these people lived in a slum in Birmingham in really very bad conditions, but out they come to Burma, and there's a picture of them sitting in the middle of a, a sort of a group of servants, and it's captioned John and Annie of Burma, as if they were sort of the Lord and Lady. Um, and I mean, it must have allowed them to have this fantasy that they actually sort of had a position and so on by virtue, of course, of their race. I mean, because you know that sort of overrode their very low class back in back in England. Um, and so it allowed that reinvention. It also allowed people to reinvent themselves racially as well, of course. And the case I think is really fascinating there is the real story of Anna Leon Owens, who's the woman in The King and I. And some of you, I'm sure many of you have seen that musical. And her real story is actually fascinating in that in real life, she was um, actually of mixed race. She wasn't a white woman from Surrey, as she pretended to be. Um, she had, in fact, been born in Bombay and uh, of parentage where her mother was mixed race um, and Indian. And so this was, of course, at the time, rather considered very kind of shady. So she reinvented herself. She went off to Siam, and Siam was a closed court. They'd never met really any women before, white women or Indian women. So she said, I'm a white woman from Surrey. And they said, fine, this must be what white women from Surrey are like. Um, and she sort of got away with this whole story about how this is what she was. Um, and she never got rumbled off. She went for the rest of her life. And fine, she'd never been to Surrey, but she did eventually go. Didn't like it very much. Went off to the US instead. But you know, it allowed this sort of great degree of you could sort of move and then become someone new. Mm. Um, and I think later in my period, when you get to people you know, who are sort of rather more politically serious people like Annie Besant um, or, or Edwina Mountbatten later on, um, again, they find a kind of freedom from the sort of gender constraints that bind them in Britain. When they come here, there's a different, a different take. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting um, that you, your period in particular uh, is, is one that I'm, I'm aware of because in England, you had the growing cries of the suffragettes saying, give us a voice, give us a voice. In the 1900s, moving on, you had avaz though, avaz though, give us a voice, give us a voice in India. And Annie Besant is, a, is an ideal example of somebody who believed in feminism and freedom for the native, as they, they used to call it at that time. Yes, home rule. Yes, yeah. I mean, these became kind of parallel causes to some degree, um, not to deny that there was also, as you've obviously written about, you know, a great deal of racism actually among the suffragettes and, you know, some problems with that too. But um, there was a sense, certainly, that you could sort of, you know, that there was some parallel in the oppression of women and in the oppression of you know, Indians or so on, mm. and that actually there was common cause was possible. Mm -hmm. um, and also, of course, I think for white women that came in, you know, in the 20th century, 
Um, I mean, something that stunned Edwina Mountbatten when she came was that so many women were involved in Indian politics, because this wasn't the case in Britain or America at the time. Representation in the Indian National Congress was far better than it was in, say, the Labour Party in Britain or in the Democratic Party in the US. You know, it was actually much better here, and you had these women like Sarojini and Sarojini Naidu, Naidu yeah, and Amrit Kaur and these yeah. women who were very active. And, and women like Edwina Mountbatten thought, oh, hold on a minute, wait, this is actually possible. Um, and actually became very interested in Indian feminism. It, there's, a, there's a class thing that, that went on at that time. I mean, the, the people that you refer to are aristocratic, whether it's Naidu or it's Mountbatten. Mm. And class, which has such a stranglehold on society in Britain during the periods that you mm. both spoke of, did that translate to India? Or were all bets off, were all class stratas destroyed? Because by virtue of the color of your skin, you were almost immediately an aristocrat, even if you came from Whitechapel and ended up here. I'm from Whitechapel. Yeah, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's much swisher now. now. <laughs> it's yeah. um, I think that two, Just bring it a bit closer. Yeah, yeah. I think two things. One is that it was much, much harder for any English person to really even mix in Indian society at all, especially for women. Well, if women technically were able to do so more because they had access to the women who were in Purdo or who were in Zananas that the men didn't have access to. But on the whole, the society was very, very segregated. And so it's not actually that surprising that English society became as segregated within its own ranks as it, as it was. But it's certainly true that you could um, get away with a lot in terms of class as well. And that the story that most strikes me as I um, think about this is a woman called Charlotte Hayes, who um, came to India as the consort of a, a famous English diarist called William Hickey. William Hickey wrote a wonderful six volume, incredibly gossipy, incredibly scurrilous um, series of diaries about his life, absolutely no holds barred, including his very, very, um, um, energetic sex life that he had. And in London, he had a, a girlfriend, really, a, this woman who was a very famous courtesan in London called Charlotte Hayes. And when Hickey went to India, he was a barrister and he went back to live in Calcutta. He took this woman, Charlotte Hayes, with him. And on the journey over, Charlotte Hayes was transformed from being Charlotte Hayes' courtesan who couldn't mix remotely with William Hickey's family. She never would have been introduced to them in any way. And she became Mrs. Hickey. But she wasn't really Mrs. Hickey. She never married William Hickey. But she passed herself off, as did a number of other famous courtesans of the same ilk as her. These were high class, high class, and she wasn't a common prostitute. Uh, she was educated and so forth. But um, by the time she got to India, the few people who knew that she was actually Charlotte Hayes and not Mrs. Hickey at all turned a blind eye, and she was able to enter society and be absolutely recognized and treated as one of one, just another lady, and was in fact introduced into society with this strange thing called the setting up ceremony, which was like the way of introducing the newcomers who'd come in the, on the latest ship to all, the, you know, to all their fellow English people. And there was ne not ever a whiff not even a whiff of the fact that she was actually a courtesan. And in London, that would never, ever, ever have been possible. So mm. class barriers were in those early days. Later on, I, I should just add that this was in the late, seven, late 18th century, about 1780. Later on, that would not have been possible at all. But in those early days, it was. It would be interesting, to perhaps, to discuss how, it, how and why it changed, but early on, you so so people like Mrs. Higgy were able hmm. to find the space to become somebody yeah, new. Absolutely. But for, for a lot of women, I'm, I'm guessing, and, and maybe Margaret, you can correct me if I'm wrong, who were somebody in England, you know, they were somebody, they come over here and they are, in a way, put behind the white Zanana. As you say, you know, it's not, it's not easy. You know, they, they, are, they are told these are the people you can mix with, these are the things you can do, these are the things that are safe for you. Did that not toy with some of their pieces of mind? You know, that what, what can you do in a day if there's so much you can't do in a day? Well, I think some of them became very bored. Um, for example, Lockwood Kipling's wife, who was, he was curator of the museum here, 
And she came from a very artistic family. She was a cousin of Bone. I think one of her sisters married Bone Jones. And I think she found India boring and social life here boring. The trouble was the East India Company and then the British, the Raj, decided that if British women got involved in any form of social work in India, any involvement in Indian society, it might cause trouble. And so after the mutiny, they actively discourage British women from having anything to do. And how do they discourage it? If you've got a feisty woman who wants to go and help the children in the village where her well, husband is the collector, what does the East India Company get to say about it? What they'd say is, you're ruining your husband's career. Oh, really? And they'd say that so, so many of the British men out here were either in the army or the civil service. And so what they would say to the husband is, keep your wife under control. Um, she'll ruin your career. And that was, you know, for a woman, this was a real bind. So what a lot of women did who had intellectual interests is they became interested in Indian history, Indian culture, Indian literature. I mean, some of the early works, the early translation of the Baba Nama was done by an English woman um, and at Beveridge. And so you got women who would find ways of engaging and getting interested, but there was real pressure against them not to get too close. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by, by the women who kind of break through the cocoon. People like Emily Eden, who seem to be yeah. able to trip through uh, societies which which often would be closed even to men. Yeah. You know, she just she just doesn't care. Well, you know. she, but she doesn't have to care because she's only in India for seven years. Mm. And she comes from a very different social class. I mean, most of the women who come out to India are middle class. We, we should explain who Emily Eden oh, is. Because, yeah, so Emily Eden just, was yeah. the sister of the Governor General, Lord Dalhousie. And the people who came out as Governor Generals or Viceroys later on were from the aristocracy. They were here for a short time and they didn't care on the whole what people thought about them. And they thought the English in India were a middle class bunch anyway, so they didn't worry about it. It was the women who were here for life, or for most of their lives, who had to get on. Right. And that meant getting on with their society. So in a way, I mean, yeah. Emily Eden, for those of you who haven't, I mean, I just urge you, read her stuff. It's not only interesting and scholarly, it's hilarious. She's just downright rude about people. So she sort of writes these stories and she sort of does these pen sketches of, 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 of mah maharajas and nawabs and, and will quite happily refer to them as blockheads, idiots, drunkards, you know, and give you this sort of idea of what goes on in a way that, that the men have to be careful of and trips and has lovers and you know sort of has this incredibly bohemian existence. Now I haven't got a, an eye on the clock. How long have we got? Is it? Uh, uh, can somebody tell me how long we've got of this session? Ten minutes? High time we open the questions, um, to be, open the floor to questions. If you have a question just put your hand high in the air. Um, yes, uh, here at the front. If you wait until a microphone comes to you that would be wonderful. <coughs> Oh, of course, there may not be a microphone. Is there, is there a roving uh, mic anywhere? Thank you, ladies, for a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I just wanted to ask all of you, in fact, the panelists, that uh, uh, what effect, if any, in your opinion, did uh, social Darwinism and Darwin's theories have on attitudes towards uh, Indian and women as well in terms of gender relations between men and women? Because, you know, we have the collision of 1857, uh, the War of Independence, and the origin of the species which comes out in 1859. Can you say something about yes, social Darwinism? Even if I'm not a very good example of it, there was this view that you could take the ideas of Darwin about, human spe about natural species and apply them to human beings, and there was this idiotic dividing up, and it was, it was totally unscientific, of the human species into what was called separate species. So you had an English species, you had a German species, you had a French species, you had an Indian species, and each was different, and each was struggling for survival, and those that survived were the fittest. And there was a whole lot of theory tied in with climate as well, that those that came from colder climates, I mean, this suited the English rather well. If you came from a colder climate, you were tougher and more resilient and, and stronger backbones and so on. And so I think it did affect both the English attitude towards the peoples they ruled over, and this was true in Africa and Asia, but also affected their attitude towards their own women. They kept on worrying about the future of the race. If the women and children stayed too long in India, what would happen? Which is why they developed this practice of sending the young, when they could afford it, back to England to be educated, which was horrible for family life. A lot of the children never got over it. I remember interviewing an English woman once in England, 
who'd had a very successful career, but she'd been sent back as a child to Indi Great Britain. She said, I can't talk about India. She said, I think of it with such unhappiness because I was happy there, and then they sent me back to England, and I never really got over it. And so I think it did affect them. Um, absolutely idiotic social theories, which, alas, are still floating around in parts of the alt-right in the United States. Any Sorry. other questions? Uh, there is somebody behind that camera, just hiding behind that camera. If we can get the mic, can you see where I'm pointing? You just get the microphone to them, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is about a sore issue, rather, in Pakistan, which is basically the involvement of uh, Lady Edwina with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, huh. basically, and the uh, popular perception that. Mr. Nehru's relationship with Lady Edwina somehow affected the drawing up of or the partitioning of India, perhaps in India's favor. So to what extent in relation to British women's involvement in the politics of the empire and in the government of uh, British India, would you say this was true? And to what extent was this true in this particular case? Well, Alex, that is certainly a question for you, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and yes, my book about this is called Indian Summer, and I've detailed it at some length. I think, I mean, you know, Edwina Mountbatten did have this relationship with Jawaharlal Nehru, which was certainly romantic and intimate and carried on for the rest of their lives. Um, I think what we have to be careful of is now you said, and you're right, it is a common point of view that perhaps this affected the drawing of the partition line. I'm not sure that's the case, but it did have a political effect. Um, the drawing of the partition line was done by Radcliffe, and actually he was quite, I don't think he had a lot of contact with Edwina Mountbatten. I think he was quite separate from, from that. Um, I think where it did have an effect, which you can see quite clearly, is in the important question of, um, of whether after independence, India would become part of the Commonwealth, it would have dominion status, as it was then called. Now, this was something that Nehru had rejected for a very long time, had been you know, important to the Indian National Congress, that that would not happen, that you would have Purna Swaraj, you would have complete independence, um, which meant goodbye king, goodbye everything. Um, and you had the right wing in Britain, led by Winston Churchill and so on, who were very keen that dominion status would be what they had instead, which meant that, you know, although they would be independent, there would be some relationship that kind of persisted. Um, you wouldn't have a viceroy anymore, you'd have a governor general, so, you know, you'd have a different relationship, it would evolve. Um, and Nehru hadn't been persuaded of this for a very long time, and it's sort of said by people who were there that actually what persuaded him was, and it really came down, you know, sort of to a, a very serious question because the right wing in Britain were not going to compromise on this. Churchill said, look, I'm going to veto the whole plan and, unless this is achieved. Um, and it's Edwina who convinced Nehru of that. So that's actually a very important part of the process. Um, and she did that. It's not clear whether at that point she was having a fully romantic relationship with him or just a friendship. Um, I think it certainly became romantic later. Um, but that did have an effect, uh, so, you know, right to have some suspicion. Whether it had an effect on the partition line, I'm less sure, although I would say it is true that both Mountbatten's got on much better with Nehru than they did with Jinnah, and I do think you're right to say, is that a serious point that we should look at? Well, yes, it is. Um, there is certainly, you know, accusations of bias have flown around ever since, um, although I think also the other thing we have to be careful about with it is it tends to, I've, I've heard a lot of people attributing that situation, then, you know, in India there's sort of a sense that, ah, yes, clever Nehru, he seduced this woman to achieve this, and, you know, and here it sort of said, oh, this woman seduced him so that they could achieve this, you know, for the British, and actually I think they had a pretty organic relationship. I don't think anyone there had gone into it with the intention of this happening, but of course it had an effect. Mm. Um, we may have time for one more question, and there it, there it is, there we are, very... Um, enthusiastic waving, if you can give it to the lady there. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was watching a very interesting movie called Rangoon yesterday. It's a very popular Bollywood movie. Which film? Rangoon. Rangoon. It just came out yesterday. And it's set in pre-partition India. Now, one of the main characters, he's a Gora, for the lack of a better word. He's the head of his regiment. And he spouts Ghalib. Um, and he speaks Hindustani. But I couldn't watch it because I kept thinking that all the Indian characters, he's subordinate to them. Um, and that would never really happen in my, in my, and like you said, there was a lot of segregation in society. So 
I'm interested to know, are there any women who actually wanted to mingle with the Indian subjects or the people who uh, are technically subordinate to them, despite I, what society I'm says? I'm so glad you asked that, because I, I answer that question, all of you, but also take it to the extreme, because we all know about the Mountbatten and Nehru. Like, did English women have love affairs, or British women have love affairs with Indian men as well? So, so take it from the, the sort of understanding point to the very extreme. Let's start with the earliest. Um, era first? Um, it's quite hard to know because it would be very unlikely to be documented in any sensible way. Um, I would have thought it was much, much less likely. There were lots of men who had concubines and even wives who were Indian. Um, there is one, one woman who, I, who immediately springs to mind, a woman called Mrs. Mir Hassan Ali, who was an English woman who married a Muslim man and came to India and lived with him. In what year? Ooh. Um, Late 18th century, thank you. <laughs> yes. Late 18th century, and she left behind a rather wonderful memoir which recounts what life was like in the Zenana, and lots of um, English women who went in to visit ladies in Purda often came away not terribly delighted by what they found, but she wrote this delightful account uh, talking about how happy they were and you know it, the actual nuts and bolts of how they lived, which has always been... I don't know how successful her marriage was because she finally left and went back to England and she became um, in, involved in the household, the king's household. Um, anyway, she left this rather great memoir. But in, in, in broad terms, there were women, there were plenty of women who wanted to mix with Indians. Um, but I think the norm was, I'm quite amazed and quite horrified really by, in most women's accounts, how little they talk about the people of the land, how very, very little they talk about it. I think um, on the love affairs issue, people will always find ways to have love affairs. You know, we just don't know, but people fall in love across all sorts of lines, and that's always happened and it always will. But there were always a few English women who married Indian men. They met them when the Indians were studying in England, perhaps that happened. But there were also a lot of English women who had Indian friends. I mean, in the earlier period, there was someone like Fanny Parks, who's written a wonderful memoir about going to, going to women's quarters, riding with them, talking to them. And later on, there's a wonderful memoir by Rosamond Lawrence called Indian Embers, which is about her life and her friendships. And so I think if you want to enough, you can cross these barriers. And there were always, to their credit, English women who wanted to cross the barriers. And uh, finally, apart from the biggie, uh -huh. how often was it going on? Well, I mean, in terms of just mixing, in terms of, you know, and socially mixing, I mean, something that frustrated a lot of um, British women when they arrived in India was that they weren't able to mix with Indian women. They wanted to do that. They were quite interested often in what they would learn. And that wasn't really allowed. There was, and again, there's a sort of moral panic on both sides, actually, that everybody sort of seemed to think this would be terribly corrupting, um, and that you might fall in love with the wrong people, and that would be a disaster, the world would end. Um, so there was a lot of prevention of that, and it became more possible, actually, in sort of the early, late 19th, early 20th century, I think, when you did get, because of some, you know, aristocratic and upper middle class Indian women becoming very involved in politics, they were able then to mix with, you know, white women who were involved in politics too and so on. It became a bit more possible for some interchange. But I know that Edwina Mountbatten was very frustrated when she came to India. One of the first things she said is, well, I want to meet the Indian women leaders. And it was sort of, and there was a sort of panic in the Viceroy's house as they thought, oh my God, you know, how do we find these people? What do we do? Oh no, what will happen? You know, what will go wrong? Um, and she did make some very good friends when that was eventually allowed. Um, but there'd been a lot of resistance about it. As for affairs, well, yeah, there were. Um, and a lot of, as you say, there were marriages and so on. And it was, but it was definitely still seen as, as quite scandalous in some ways. So the sort of, you know, there would be a lot of, and not just scandalous in terms of race, but again, class. So often, you know, you'd sort of, the sort of woman who would marry a Maharaja would be some Australian showgirl that he'd picked up on the Cote d'Azur, and you know, and everybody would sneer, oh, look at her, you know, calling herself, you know, Maharani and sticking on a tiara when she's actually, you know, kind of a dancer. 
Um, although some of those relationships were very successful, actually. I mean, of course, some weren't and they broke up, but some of them worked just fine. It was, uh, as you say, this always found a way to happen, actually, across lines. Whether or not you want it to, you can't entirely stop, I'm afraid, human feeling. Well, um, you can't stop human feeling, you can't stop the march of time. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, it is so wonderful. Um, history is, is recorded by the victors and it's often recorded by the men, but to have uh, three wonderful women writers uncovering the story of women, I think is, is in fact our panel today. Thank you.